I am going to explain to everybody here why I got three hours of sleep last night. Um, and as I was working on solving this problem in the pipeline, uh, I thought this would be very intuitive because there are a bunch of lessons learned. And this, this could be for any type of pipeline. Okay? It doesn't, doesn't matter what type of pipeline. All right, so to remind you here, this is our PTF pipeline. And everything is bordered off in its own region. And what that basically means is, is that at each of these lines, there is an expectation that data will flow from one place to another will have associated metadata with it, and that data and metadata will be correct. In other words, that I have an expectation of when I fits image from the Palomar Observatory, that there'll be fits headers, keywords that will be filled out and will be accurate. And if there isn't, it will break my pipeline. Okay? And Therefore, that's not my problem. It's theirs. But I have to be smart enough to realize this and to be able to say, hey, you need to fix this. Okay. So this is the problem, all of my, my own doing, last night. Uh, so actually, it was two nights ago. I solved this problem in real time last night. Okay. So this is what happened uh, yesterday um, when I was looking uh, at the data. This is the first half of the night, and this was the sky coverage that PTF did. Okay, so they're basically right now running in sort of an every day, every other day mode, and they plowed over about 500 square, de not quite 500 square degrees in the first half of the night. This is just the location of the central chip. And you can see they did a few other random spots, and these spots right here are local universe targets, so like the Virgo cluster and, uh, you know, uh, M101 and places like that, which they like to hit. But most of it is right there, okay? The second half of the night, God knows what happened. Whoops, hey, why don't, oh, that's horrible. You guys don't have the red. I've got red on my screen. I don't have red up here. OK, well, you can just basically see what happened here. All these other fields were added in, and they were hopping everywhere across the sky. Okay, This is not something that normally happens in PTF. We usually plow across things. And like I said, we come back an hour later, plow across them. Then we shift over an RA because the sky is moving up, and we do the same thing again. We repeat it. And yet, we started bopping around back and forth. We actually came back here. We went over here. It, the telescope was just, well, I described it to the person who runs the scheduler as it looks like Tinkerbell was flying around the sky on acid. Okay? That's what it looked like to me. And the problem for me was that this killed a query that I was running. Not killed it in the sense that the query ran, but the query was taking way too long because I had gotten clever about two years ago, and I figured out a way to speed up a certain type of query. And the query goes like this. Uh, about every 30 minutes, I look at all the fields that have been subtracted and all the candidates that have been in there. And then I plow back through the entire database, and I say, associate that with other candidates in that area of the sky and match them up, OK? And call them, give them a specific identification number. Okay. And so, of course, every candidate comes with an uncertainty. The uncertainty we usually use is about three arc seconds. This is due to both astrometric precision and, of course, the signal to noise of the object. But three arc seconds is pretty good. And we go back through and we ask this question. And, and there are hundreds of thousands of queries like this for every hour. Okay. So this is what I do. Now, as I told you, every hour we usually pave apart a piece of sky, and then we take a step, pave apart a knot, and then come back again, and we repeat. Okay? So I noticed that, well, you know what? If I make the supposition that most of these queries are going to be close to each other in right ascension, I can speed things up dramatically in my query. I can hone in on just the section of the database that I need. And so I set up an optimized query that 
assumed that whoever was scheduling the observations would do something intelligent, like, you know, try to point directly up most of the time, so therefore let the sky move across. Okay, what happened when it started going all over there is that it started to having to look through the entire database, okay, across RA, or it's not actually RA, it's in this Q3C index that was set up, okay, to do this type of query, and things slowed down dramatically, and it delayed the processing tremendously. Now, I yelled at the guy who did this in a nice, polite way, who's in charge of the P48, and he said, oh my God, I shouldn't be doing that. I don't know what happened, and then he said, okay, I think I see my bug. And the reason he didn't want to be doing that was because this is, and this is from a few months ago, uh, the delay time between images and the number of images and what you see is most of the time we slew and we just have the readout, okay? And that's what this is. This is 20 seconds to readout. There's nothing we can do about that. That's a, and we try to slew within that 20 seconds. And so most of the time we do that. Sometimes we still haven't quite got there, but that's because we're just usually, we target this field, then we go over here, and then we come back, and, you know, and we're right next to each other. So most of the time this is unnoticeable. But if you look at these, these tend to draw beautiful linear correlation with the delay time between images and the degree of slew that happens between the images. And so this was hurting them too because last night we were only about 85% as efficient as we should have been in terms of this dead time, you know, slewing across the sky. So this was a problem he wanted analyzed as well. And so this is one of the things about pipelines um, that you have to realize is that you can be this great person who thinks about everything, thinks about all possible contingencies, builds it up, optimizes it, and you think you're done, and now this pipeline can run great for the next few years. And that is not, in fact, what happens. It is a constant effort to improve things along the way, to handle things. And so here are just some some lessons learned, some points to ponder. Um, it is very good to define the boundaries of the pipeline. Who passes what to whom very, very well. And the reason being is that if you don't do it, at the end of the day, it comes down to the last part of the pipeline that speaks to the collaboration and all the blame will be put on them. Okay? And all the work will be put on them to handle it and fix and solve the problem. And that's never good. It's always good to have things very nicely defined. You need to pass me this. It has to have this quality, this percentage of the time, et cetera. It's very important to have the scientists invested in in working on the pipeline. CS folks are great. They usually are much, much more clever than scientists are in terms of maximizing things. However, they're not invested in the science results. Okay? What they're invested in is, is accomplishing something on the CS side of things that works well. So they're not motivated in the same way. Uh, and so I like to have a real rapid turnaround time between the observations and what goes in my database. The reason being is then I can trigger follow-up observations immediately. They're interested in perhaps different things. And they're not going to be up at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to solve this problem. Well, they could be, but I don't have that type of cash on hand to pay them. CS people are very expensive. Um, continually rewrite your code when you see the opportunity for improvement and optimization. And this keeps you invested and motivated in the project at all times. When you have some free time, Think about that problem that you'd like to solve that would speed things up that you know is in the background there. So I rewrote this query entirely in a different way to solve this type of problem. So it took a 15% performance hit over what I was doing before, assuming that things would be nice, but now it can handle any type of observational sequence. Okay? And the most important thing is to keep the lines of communication open between the pipelines. You'll see a lot of the things that people are doing now are very international. You'll have data over here. You'll have people over here that want to access that data. There'll be a supercomputing facility in another spot where they'll want to do something on it or locally or whatever. 
And there's a lot of lines of communications. And if you know all the players in it and you can speak to them well and clearly, it just makes things infinitely easier to work on in the future, especially when any problems crop up. So uh, now I'll tell you about, well, OK. So I'm going to move from this to two talks on parallel databases that we've been playing with. Uh, and the, the parallel databases are things that are coming online right now, I would say, for scientists, OK? Places have been using MapReduce, Hadoop, things like that for a while. Um, this is just something now that we're experiencing in, in a major way. Uh, but we have different types of problems to solve than they do. And so it's not always the easiest to just take a solution um, that works for the business world and apply it to science. And so here are a couple of parallel databases that aim to do it. And what I hope to do is sort of describe how these work, um, where, where they're going, why they work better for scientists, what their problems are, what problems are with existing ones, and uh, sort of step you through it and define some of the words so that you're at least familiar with it. OK, let's see here, full screen. All right, so the first one is um, Aster. Oh, that's why I don't have red. There we go. OK, first one is a product called Aster Data. Uh, it's run by a company called Teradata. OK, and this is, this is basically how it works. What they, OK, and now, now I'll describe to you the, the pain in databases. OK, anybody give me an idea how much it costs to have a database like Oracle on a node, a eight core node? What? Yes. <laughs> Take a guess. How much do you think a commercial database like Oracle costs? Any idea? 100,000, 125,000 per core. Now, they'll let you run on as much data as you want. But you want to throw another core at the problem, they'll charge you more. OK? And this is to get their full on big time service. OK? Ah, OK. Why would somebody want to do that? Because it comes with a lot of built-in front ends and back ends, which you don't have to build with the open source solutions. OK? So you wait, and also people on call 24-7 to come up and solve a problem with your database. And oh, they back themselves up nicely. And they do all these wonderful things for you that you don't have to pay a CS person in-house to handle for you. Uh, and always filled with just as many wrong answers as right answers. Ah, so now you require me to be smart. OK, let me stop and hold on, hold on a second. Let me stop and tell you about how smart scientists are. Now, CS people, I agree, are smart, OK, when it comes to managing systems. They don't give a rat's ass about the science, but they're smart, OK? They won't do something dumb like the following. We have a lovely database in PTF that keeps track of all of our observations, all of our follow-up observations, and it's tied to my database basically by the what we call the LBL ID number. I give every transient detection an ID number. It's this massive, you know, it's up heading up towards a billion right now. Okay, it's just this big end. Okay? And they have associated with that a PTF name. We've now found it. We like it. We call it PTF, two digits of the year, so 09 through 12. And then we start A through Z, AA through ZZ. And we actually got up to four letters, although we didn't get up to any of the bad four-letter words. So that's about how far we go. OK. This database resides down at Caltech. It's a good place to keep it because we have most of the follow-up capabilities down there. OK. Now, you have a nice relational database like Postgres. Okay, what is one of the features of Postgres, which is horrible? 
delete. Okay? Delete is not a good thing to have in any database. Okay? We have a process at LBL set up by the CS folks that two people had to sign off on doing any deletes in a database. And even then, we had one person watch over another person's shoulder while they did it. Okay? That's how bad delete is. Okay? Unfortunately, at Caltech, a graduate student had root access to this machine, decided, oh, you know what? I'm going to create this new table, and I'm going to copy all this data over there, screwed up the table, and said, oh, I'll just delete it, but actually deleted the entire table of the original data. Okay, so you say, no big deal, people make backups. Oh, they do. But what they did was they backed up on top of the data that they backed up the previous night. And this student was working late at night and happened to do it just as the backup was going. And so it backed up a database that was empty. Okay? So that is a thing where you can have mistakes happen when you let scientists into the world of CS people. So you do have to be smart. If everybody is smart in the pipeline, yes, it will work nicely and efficiently and well. The problem is we all have postdocs, we all have graduate students, we want them to solve problems, we give them capabilities that perhaps they shouldn't have, and problems happen. So we are not always smart. And even, you know, the professor of 30 years goes in and munctions some things up. So that happens as well. Okay, AstroData has an entirely different operating scheme for charging, okay? They see the big data revolution, and they decide to charge by the terabyte of data. You can throw as many processors as you want. You've got a supercomputing facility with 200,000 cores, more power to you. You can use them all. We don't care. We're just going to charge you by the terabyte. They charge $100,000 for the first terabyte of data, okay? It drops down. If you buy 50 terabytes of space from them, it's then at a price of about, oh, 5 to 10K a terabyte, okay? Their biggest customer, this is very scary to say, okay? It's one of those online poker companies, okay? Now, we'll get to why this is a powerful thing for science, but it's basically because of embedded analytics. Okay. What they want to do is they have hundreds of thousands of hands happening. It's one of the largest companies at any one time, and they want to look for people who are cheating. How do you cheat? It's very difficult to cheat in online poker, but basically you get two people into the same poker game that can then talk to each other about their hands. And they try to randomize it so that never happens, but occasionally it does. But by monitoring it and seeing if anybody is playing at an absurdly high level, with real-time analytics of the hands, and that's the key thing, real-time analytics of the hands, they can go in and investigate this. I asked them, how big was their database? 2.5 petabytes. They analyze every single hand that's ever been played on their, on their, on their They go back to do studies of where they have known cases of people cheating, and they do this in real time and apply this machine learning algorithms in the future. Okay. You know, PokerStars.net must be making a lot of money to pay for that type of data. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about one that costs something here, that's a parallel database, and one that's free. So this is the one that costs something. Okay, so, how do these basically work up? Um, you have some queries, okay? Uh, what do you want to do? You want to do reports. How much data did we process last night? Um, what simulations were run? How big are they? Okay, there's where your queries go. The queries go off to the queen, okay? The queen then passes this to worker nodes, and then on the other side of the worker nodes, you have loader nodes, and they can load things in parallel as well, okay? So you can have clusters of tens to hundreds of commodity boxes. That's what they like to see. They want to keep the hardware as cheap as possible. Um, you have these four independent share-nothing tiers that I just went through for processing, loading, and backup. And by the way, um, everybody understands how RAID works on disks and splitting the data across. They do the same thing in their database, okay? So it's nice in the sense that one of the worker nodes goes down, one of the queen nodes, one of the loader nodes goes down. The other ones are there just to pick it up. 
It alerts you to this. You can bring in other resources on the fly. It'll restripe it across it. So it's very nice in that. Um, and it has in database SQL MapReduce uh, to enable a parallelization and analytics processing. Okay? So it's built for data growth. You can just throw more cores at it, more disks at it, and, and it should scale nicely. They really worked hard on faster loading. They realized that a lot of these data sets are, are going to be dumping terabytes of data down, and you want to suck it in and analyze it as fast as possible. Okay? Uh, they wanted to make some things easy, so you can ask just basic SQL queries, okay? And it will parallelize those for you. You don't have to think about it, okay? Uh, and it has SQL support, you know, standard, whoops, standard SQL, uh, the Java interfaces, the C interfaces, there are other ones that, that you can even make. Um, Built-in data replication, as I said, and, and relatively low cost. You don't need a supercomputer. Um, so, uh, their end cluster approach is optimized for dimensional models. I'll talk about that in the next uh, slide. You can have distributed tables or replicated tables. And there are reasons for having both, and there are reasons for having mixtures of both. The idea is that you want to try to do everything as locally as possible, so that a core is looking at a problem and it has all the data that it needs, that you don't have to shuffle the core, uh, the, the data that a core gets out from to, to any of the other cores. You just want to be able to shove it back to the queen, okay? And, and what they work hard on is schema modeling. So you put in the type of query you want and the thing can analyze it and say, you know, you should really set up your database this way with this type of schema. And I'll show you. So uh, first thing, star schema. So just to describe this to you, um, a weather star schema that records weather data has, has what, then the keyword here is facts. Facts of temperature, barometric pressure, wind speed, precipitation, cloud cover. They consider those the facts. So they like to keep those together. And then you have dimensions of location, date, time, you know, where it came from, who reported it, all of the things like that. They're designed to optimize user ease of use and retrieval performance by minimizing the number of tables to join. So in a lot of ways, if you think about the types of joins you normally do in a table, like let's say I want to look up in a galaxy catalog, I want to find all galaxies of this type at this redshift. Okay? So you're joining a few tables there. Okay, so you sort by color, and you sort by redshift, certain, you know, uncertainty or error in there. What they would do is group those things differently to anticipate this type of query so that it's faster. So that's the way it works. The dimensions go the other way. Uh, and the way to think about it is, is that, and the way the name came out, is that it resembles a constellation of stars. And so you have bright stars, which are the facts surrounded by the dimmer ones, which are the dimensions. And here's just one from, from sales thing, where these are the types of things that you'd, you'd normally join on in a, in a straight up relational base. You know, the date ID, the store ID, the product or units sold. That's what you want to store as facts. And then you have dimensions off here that come down off of this. And so this speeds up questions that you'd like to answer, like, I want to know how many units were sold this month in total. It's right there. It's immediately knowable. OK. So what does the queen do? The queen manages the system's configurations, the schema, and the error handling. It presents query interface. So you can type in, like I said, SQL through Java, through C. Um, and, and they work really hard to, to have this all set up so that it works in a web interface nicely. Um, and you optimize the query in three steps. So the first one, you parse the SQL statement, hand it off to the planner. The planner develops a set of subqueries to be executed, and the executor will execute the subqueries and aggregate the results. So it sends it down, says, OK, go ahead, worker nodes, execute these, and then it sucks them back up. OK? So 
what they want to try to do is maximize the local computation and minimize the network flow. So it's not too different than the way GPUs work, okay? What you want to do is give the GPU a really hard math problem to chomp on for a while and then spit back just one number, okay? So GPUs, what are they really good at? Things like FFTs, okay? Why? A lot of calculations, it can crank on them and it comes back with a very short amount of data, okay? So, um, so this is just basically, you know, global optimizer and then it splits it down to the workers. And then you reduce the data fully before sending it across the network. So once again, trying to limit the amount of communications that you have, okay? The worker nodes store the data and they interact with the queen and the other workers. So this is where your data is, is replicated, where your data is spread out across the machines. Um, they work on balancing the storage, balancing the processing. If they see some queries that are being asked several times uh, that are not performing well, uh, it can offer you suggestions on how to, say, re-stripe the data, re-replicate tables, do things to improve those. Okay. And then the loader node. Okay. This is a key thing. You have a large amount of data. You want this to come in, the loader node looks at it, splits it up, sucks it in, and then distributes this across the worker nodes to pull in the new data. And of course, you, you have this happening at the same time. People are asking queries as new data is coming in. So, so this is handled. Another great thing about this system is that, like a supercomputing center, you can assign priorities to users. So say you like the astrophysicist, you give them 80% of the time, and the biologist and chemist, you don't like that much, you give them the remaining 20, okay? They can submit scheduled jobs, okay? They can submit it, and, and if nobody's on the machine, it'll let them use all the resources. Astrophysicist comes on, and it'll shove them down to a fewer number of worker nodes, and the astrophysicist will hog up the other ones. So that's sort of a neat function. The other thing it does is, uh, separates out uh, things either be a row store or a column store, okay? Now, row store is the standard way like a relational database like Postgres works. Straight up. That's not exactly true because one of the things you learned about earlier was indexing and say spatial indexing, okay? That is a way to get performance that is different than uh, just the straight row store. Okay, row stores, all the data is sequential, so you've got to go through the entire row before you go down to the next one. But let's say, you know, one of the things we had here was like magnitude of the stars, and what you wanted was, I just want the median magnitude of the stars. Better if that's in a column store. And then just go down, that's quick query, you get your answer. Okay, so I'm unable right now to give you all access to this wonderful machine. But you can get a VMware version of it here, and the slides you'll have later, and so you can go grab it. And this will actually, you'll able to run it on a PC with any 64-bit operating system. And, and it will replicate a queen and a worker, and you can put queries into it and see how it does this and see how it splits things up. It's, it's quite neat. Nurse will actually have one of these systems up and running uh, for its community uh, by, well, certainly before the next allocation period, Jan 1. Okay, so here are some things on creating tables. So like I said, before you can distribute a table uh, all the way across all the worker nodes, or you can replicate the table across the worker nodes, and you can do that implicitly. Uh, so here's a table, and it's distribute by hash, okay? So this is a fact table, like I described in the uh, star schema. Fact tables must be distributed by hash, okay? That's, that's the only way that they're useful. You can do the storage in row, column. Uh, you can pick some of both if you wanted, okay? But, so this is one in which you spread it out across the worker nodes, okay? So you can envision something like that where it's a very computationally intense query and you want to gain the advantage of all the CPUs working on a particular chunk of that table. Now, you can also have distribute by replication, okay? That is when you need the entire table 
in order to answer a question, okay? So sorting, something like that, where you're asking multiple questions of it. That's something where if it's sitting all within one core, it's better, okay? Um, you can, of course, wind up with multiple versions. You can do some of it in hash, some uh, by list, by replication. You can have all types of wonderful things like that. Okay, so wind up on these slides with just some generic discussion on, on databases and MapReduce and things like that. Okay. Um, so, databases have been around a long time for data analysis engines, for reporting on structured data. Uh, SQL is, you know, a standard that's pretty easy. Uh, it's, it's fairly high level. It works on any schema. So, if you can scale SQL up to large amounts of data, you know, that's happening now. There are several places with petabytes of data. Data warehouses, which maintain these dimensional, these star schema things, they're well established. And databases have, you know, any code you guys looking at now, Python, you name it, they're all set up to hook into databases automatically, Postgres, MySQL, you name it. All right, shortcomings of the databases. Okay, this is why we don't like relational databases. They're not suited well for multi-structured data. Big data structure is often unknown prior to exploration. If you think about your problem in a certain way, you know what, you're gonna be really good at solving that problem that way, okay? But if you come along the line and make a new discovery, what you would like to be able to do is do that in an optimized way at all. And relational databases, unless you thought about that from the start, they're just not as good. Um, and another big problem is, of course, loading the data. It's often very, very costly in terms of time. Uh, SQL is a poor match for some problems. Some queries are cumbersome, non-intuitive, impossible to express. You'd like to do it in another language than SQL, okay? And traditional user-defined functions just don't work so well in standard relational databases, okay? And, and things like functions that you drop in there, they're just not necessarily parallelized, table parallelization, okay? So MapReduce, okay, so MapReduce movement comes along. MapReduce scales the processing to huge data volumes, okay? So, you know, you have, you have a large number of uh, well-known internet companies using MapReduce. Uh, it overcomes the scale and expressiveness problems of traditional databases, okay? Excellent programming model, simple to understand, structured to facilitate parallelization, implemented in many, many languages. And here's an example of what MapReduce is about. So I just want to do a word count, okay? And here's the input. And the input gets split up. It then gets mapped over here, okay? Then you shuffle it around, okay? Then you reduce it, okay? So map reduce, hence the name. And then you spit back the final result, okay? So one really weird aspect of map reduce. If I flipped this input around, the problem could be solved in a completely different way get the same result, just wouldn't necessarily come out the same way. Same amount of time, the mapping and the reduce would be different, okay? That is a part of MapReduce that many people don't like, okay? MapReduce is heavily oriented towards coding. New questions frequently means new code, okay? So you have to sit down and write it, and it's very hard to iterate, okay? Um, you lose the declarative reusable functionality of SQL, uh, the data model, the schema, the statistics, the local optimization, all of that goes out because you can't anticipate, due to the way things get mapped and reduced, how that's gonna work necessarily all the time. And, and you lose things like general purpose algorithms like joins, groupings, and sortings. That's just not as good. So, Aster, what they want to do is try to create the best of both worlds, okay? 
So, and, and this is where a lot of things are headed in sort of parallel databases and science. And when I get to SciDB, you'll see why they like this area as well. So scalable, it should be easy to leverage hardware resources of hundreds of servers. Okay, that's, that's a must have. Fault tolerance should be handled by the system. Okay, it should be analyst friendly. Okay, we, you, want, you want to be able to write in any language of your choice. Okay, you want to create reusable tools. And you don't want to have the semantics of the queries mixed up with the implementation details. Developer friendly. Want a straightforward programming model and a useful platform to provide services to the developer to maximize their freedom. So this is how they combined it, okay? Uh, and the big thing that they work on is uh, the analytics. So time series data, graph analysis, path analysis, you know, pattern analysis, uh, machine learning algorithms, that's what they're big on. Um, Batch and interactive queries. Some queries you'll run take hours, okay? You want to be able to let other people do stuff while you're on there, so you want to be able to divide up the resources accordingly. So that's what this lets you do in a very nice, intuitive way, okay? And it provides a single process for executing both SQL and MapReduce logic. So you have the queen node, you talk to it, it figures out how to do everything else for you, okay? Um, so combine standard SQL and MapReduce, that's nice. Um, and, and if anybody has ever tried to do MapReduce on their own, you'll know, well, it's a, there's a learning curve associated with it. OK. So uh, this SQL MapReduce enables the execution of user code. This is why it's really good for scientists. OK. You install the user code throughout the cluster and then you can invoke it in part of your SQL query. And the execution of this code is automatically parallelized across the cluster. And so you can just write a bit of Python code that's going to take this value from this column, this value from this column, do something to it, and stick it somewhere else. All right? That's really powerful. Okay? You can do it in a bunch of other languages as well. All right, so that is Aster. Now I'm going to turn towards one which is new, free, okay, so free is good, okay, but to be fair, I won't call it pre-alpha, I think they've reached the stage of alpha, um, but it ain't anywhere near a beta version yet, okay, and I know this through personal experience. Um, so this is PsyDB. Okay, so how is, uh, SciDB different, okay, the main thing is that it's an array data model, okay, and this is really good for scientists, especially people dealing with imaging data, uh, multiple dimensions, okay. This is the way they're, they're set up. I'll, I'll show an example of why this is, this is a really neat way to do some, some things, especially in, in imaging data. Okay, why do things in arrays, okay? Well, just think about it. A lot of problems that you want to solve uh, are things that could take advantage of numerical libraries like the BLAS, the LAPACs, Parallel Sky LAPAC. Okay, these are open source tools. And wouldn't it be great just to have that work in the database as fast as possible? Okay? So storing things in arrays, and, and to give you an idea, this, uh, I think a lot of this background has to do with people experimenting with things like co-array Fortran, in which it's set up to handle those in an optimized way. And they wanted to provide that type of thing. A lot of scientists deal with data that comes in this form, OK? So here's a, here's a PsyDB data definition, OK? So you have some array. Here are the attributes v1 through v3, OK? And you have some dimensions, OK? So this one is, you know, unbounded dimension for i here. j goes through 0 through 9. They have something called a chunk size. I'll talk about that in just a bit. But basically, it's uh, size for replication, OK? I'll do the first here. They've set it to 0. But if you made it 4, you do 4. And then you know it'd split things up that way. And then how much overlap, OK? 
I'll get to why that's important in a bit. Okay, and then you have two languages which you can query with, but you can see there are some very nice features here. If you ever tried to do an average in Postgres, <laughs> okay, well, don't hold your breath, okay? But this is a great way to push through uh, things like that where you're operating on the, on the array. It is lightning quick. Okay? Now, CIDB. There's no overwrite. Okay? There's no delete. Okay? You just throw things on top of it and you version it. That is a really, really great way to go forward. Because you can, if you make a mistake, you can always go back and say, you know what? Right here is where everything was working. I want to go back to the version of the database at this date. You can do that with the uh, newest Postgres. Um, there are ways to do this. This is a very nice feature, uh, I think, especially in science, especially when you're collecting data. Um, there's a provenance log of all queries to reconstruct how the results were derived. Okay. And it works well with uncertainties and statistical reasoning and error bars, okay? And so, you know, a relational database where you store data like this, i, j, and a value, and then you wanted to look at this subset of data, you got to go, doot, 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 doot. oh, there's one, there's another, skip, skip, there's one, there's another, and then you get these and you work on it, okay? So IDB, it's stored like that, okay? So you can see how it speeds up data access in a distributed database quite easily. All right, so why is this cool for astronomers and especially this, this overlap, okay? So up here I've drawn sort of a cartoon of two galaxies and a star. And let's say I put in an overlap of a few and a chunk size of like five, okay, in both dimensions, you know, and I have something like this. Okay, and then I'll go like this, and then I go like this. Okay, so all of these are stored, okay, along with the replication. Okay, one of the things we often ask ourselves in astronomy is I want to know about an object, but the objects aren't nice enough to lie at a certain IJ location. They're over here. If you chunk it up based upon an approximate size, then you can do your analysis on this object within the database really quickly. The way I think about this is, is that one of the ways this PsiDB may go in the future is that you're not storing results from your analysis, like what is the size of this galaxy, its orientation, its ellipticity, its brightness. You actually store the actual pixel level data in there. And then you can work on it. And it's really, really fast for doing that type of manipulation. And the chunking is a great way to spread it across multiple processors so you can analyze this array in parallel quite trivially. Okay? And then there's very little communication back and forth, except on the odd case where you, you, know, you miss something. Okay? And then you can do the communication after the fact. But if you set your chunk size up right to start with, it shouldn't happen too often. Okay? So... Uh, here's an example of SQL versus PsiDB. Uh, they're trying to load in the USNO uh, B catalog. Okay, so you have right ascension, declination, uh, B band magnitude, and R band magnitude. Okay, and how does PsiDB do this? It creates an array. Okay, the array, of course, is the right ascension and declination. The values are the two dimensional B and R band magnitude. Okay, and then let's say you want to go through and you want to locate uh, everything within a certain range. Okay, so you, you have two locations, you have some swath in the number of degrees, and you want to pull back all of these things. So this is what the SQL statement looks like. Okay, so you have to query the table twice, okay, and then you go through and you do this location with the uncertainty up and down like this. This is how you do it in PsiDB. Give it the range, boom, give it the count. Infinitely faster. And here's a picture of, of the chunking and why one would want to go forward and do that and how you can set it up differently. Okay? So, uh, very much similar to the way Aster sets things up. You have a client, 
can use iQuery, you can use Python, that's very nice. There's an engine, okay? And then uh, there's a Postgres uh, persistent system that just basically is there for cataloging, okay? Relational database is really good for cataloging, okay? And then you split things off to the different nodes, okay? Where they each have some fraction of the chunks and the data, okay? And then goes back out with your result, okay? So PsyDB is not MapReduce. Um, it supports ad hoc queries. Um, you know, people want to use things like R. Once again, it's pushing the analytics there. You use R, you use Python, whatever you want. Linear algebra, it is geared to do that and do that well. And, you know, data is updatable, versioning. It is a very, very powerful technique. Okay, so this, though, I would say is not, well, I think it's a great sort of summertime project, okay? Get a hold of it, install it, play with it. Um, the manuals aren't the best, but the people in the forums right now are really, really good, okay? And that's where all of it is at. It is really cutting edge. Uh, LSST has tied itself uh, to PsyDB, uh, has started originally um, a, a push for this along with many other places uh, within the national labs. Um, you know, so I, I think this will catch on. I hope it will catch on because as was mentioned, free is a lot better than $100,000 a terabyte or a core, okay? I'll leave it there and take any questions, thanks. Yes. So at the end of your talk, you alluded to the beginning of that section. Yes. You alluded to the fact that side B isn't ready for prime time. Would you care to elaborate? Okay. So I thought, okay, so we, we, we have an 80 node rack uh, of carver that I hauled away to put Aster on the top 40 nodes and side DB on the bottom 40. The idea is to test these things head to head. So the Aster stuff is, is fairly well straightforward to pull in a uh, catalog. I want to pull in the entire Sloan data set, okay, and then, and then run some interesting queries on it. SciDB is not quite ready to handle that yet, okay. Um, data was in FITS tables, a standard way that uh, Sloan uh, stores things. Um, they didn't have FITS readers. I thought, that was strange. This is supposed to be, you know, has a big, strong astronomy background. Um, they actually said it would be better if we stored the raw data than the tables and columns of, you know, the 132 outputs that you get on every single Sloan object in the sky, that they weren't really good at handling that, even if we broke it up into a nice array. So what I quickly discovered was that, that while they have a couple people that are working on this and they're good uh, on the CS side of things, that they haven't had much real experience and it open source and so they were hoping that I could come in and develop all the stuff they needed. And I was like, oh. Okay, <laughs> so so I was a little bit surprised. So I am going to do that. I have I have somebody that's going to work on this. Uh, we have three projects at Nurse, which is going to work on both of these database systems. It's a biology project, climate project, and an astro project. And so we're going to try all three of these. But there is a lot more work to do on the SciDB uh, than than I originally supposed. Now that said. Uh, the Python interface to it will make it a little bit easier for us to get up and running in speed on some types of things that people already do with their data in those three areas. So, you know, advantages, disadvantages. Um, but the free is really good. So, because people time I can buy, hardware and software is much more difficult to come by the money for. So.
for side EV? Yeah. Uh, my best guess looking at the forums that, yeah, that there are 10 hardcore people and maybe 50 people total that have a, uh, an abiding interest in it, you know? So it's that type of level. So m I, I think critical mass is about 100 active people in terms of pushing an open source project to the next level. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to bring more people to bear on this because uh, I think it could be quite powerful, especially for the image processing stuff. Um, but, you know, there's a few bits, there's a bit of work. I mean, good thing LSST is not coming in a year, you know, so. And we have some nice small data sets, small, I mean, 100 terabytes or so that we could, uh, that would be interesting. Uh, On the other hand, Okay, so, <laughs> um, okay, I, 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 let's see, how to state the following without insulting too many people. Um, okay, PanStars has its own woes, I would say, on the computational side of things, okay? Uh, in, and, and, and I'll just say, I think they have all they can do to promise what they originally were supposed to deliver and, and get on top of that. And a little bit surprising given how long it took the project to come up to speed, but you know, hey, uh, it's not trivial. DES is going through NCSA uh, for their processing. They, you know, the way the DOE develops these projects is that, okay, DOE will provide this and this, NSF will provide this and this. This is how the data will be reduced. This is how we will interact. So yes, I could imagine somebody doing this, but DOE would not pay for it a priori, unless you could say, I'm going to bring some added value to the DES collaboration uh, that they can't even realize right now, which may very well be the case. But I think somebody would have to push SciDB much farther along with some real test case examples of how this could be powerful enough that they could take advantage of it in the next five years. Um, to make that a reality. Somebody may do this, um, but you know, that's, that's also not trivial. So it sounds like the engine is there, but the project is languishing for lack of application adopting it. Is that a fair summary? I, I would say, yeah. So, so one thing everybody should know about, about databases and file formats and anything is that it's the glue. It's basically how you talk to that engine that is the, the hard part. And yes, that to me seems to be what's missing right now is that once we get over this, once this, this little group of 10 or so people starts to develop that glue that where I can just shove my data as is into the database, then things are going to take off because that engine will work and then it's trivial to sit down and write little bits of analysis code that can take advantage of the power of it. So I think it just needs to get over that, that hump um, is where it's sitting. Yeah, some ready cash to do a few things. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm not worried about them surviving. I'm more worried about 
things being ready to to make the statement. You know what? I mean, it would be a huge. I don't. You guys know the way data is taken and stored and placed around. If you actually have your data sitting in a parallel database, your actual raw data sitting there, there are lots of things that you can imagine doing on the fly very quickly that you can't do right now. And the I.O. is just infinitely faster. Uh, that would be a huge breakthrough. But the question is, are they going to make that breakthrough in time for, say, uh, DOE and NSF to say, you know, that's the way we're going to do things with CIDB for LSST. Don't know. Don't know. Uh, I hope so. I really do hope so. Um, so I think for folks your age, okay, a few years down the road, you know, five, six years down the road, okay, you're looking for a job, and guess what? LSST will be just around the corner. And so learning about this now, maybe you are the guys that will take PsyDB and push it over the hump to where it's something that's uh, really usable, okay? And that is the power of the open source uh, stuff. So, um, you know, not a bad time to get involved. Uh, and certainly, if you become an expert in it, uh, jobs will abound for you when you get out, so. Anything else? <laughs> I mean, we have that there is one more open source database which is actually pretty good at performs well. It's called MoneyDB by Market Airshare. And that has the advantage that you can write so there is no paging and, and page formatting, so you can use an external utility essentially to write files that can be the actual database. So we yeah. And then the one type of database that I didn't talk about, or what do people call them, the no SQL databases, uh, things like Mongo. Um, those are also interesting, not for this type of stuff, not for the image, but they can be very useful in uh, machine learning applications, et cetera. Uh, Josh Bloom actually used a database like that to ingest um, OCR scanned articles on variable stars, OK? so that he could mine it um, to help him classify uh, different types of variable stars. He actually mined data papers okay, for this, including tables of data, everything. Okay, so they're very powerful, but in a different way. They're easily parallelizable. Okay? They easily take advantage of MapReduce and Hadoop uh, and things like that. So they're also something that one should not ignore. It's, once again, right tool for the right problem, and, and just try to figure out which one's best. Okay. I'll leave it there.